Greetings to all of you in the name of our living Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, also, for those of you who are at home who are not members of Emmanuel, we invite you to, to go to our website, GodSoLoved.org, and there you'll find information about Emmanuel. If you have any questions, uh, we also have a school. Please feel free to give us a call and we'll get right back with you with the answers. As we gather around God's Word today, I've announced that we are going to do a two-week sermon series on the corporate nature of the church. Now, if you look at your sermon outline, there is something missing there. I don't know why. But it says the corporate nature of the church sermon series. Week one, what is the church? Week two, the corporate nature of the church should be right underneath that. Week two, corporate nature of the church. Now, why are we doing this? Well, on September 12th, it has been our target to bring things back to normal as much as we are able. Of course, we've had this, this surge here to deal with, and we'll deal with that appropriately as we encourage you to continue to social distance in here and try not to sit behind one another and follow the little blue pieces of tape in the pew. But it is our day that we're going to get back together with Bible study, Sunday school at 9 o'clock, and 10 o'clock our, our worship service, and we'll be adding in more, more liturgy and uh, uh, start to bring things back to normal as much as we can and as much as we are able in regards to COVID. As we gather around God's Word, I've put this two-week series together to help us address, number one, what is the church we're going to talk about today, and number two, what is the corporate nature of the church? Because we're going to come to a time, if we haven't come to that time already, where our time at home was needed. Uh, first, when we recorded the services. Secondly, when we started the services for those who were able. And uh, we want to encourage those who are able now to consider uh, coming back to church. So that's uh, the focus, uh, and the focus is on September 12th, uh, if possible, and we want to continue that. With that being said, let's begin with our opening hymn as I invite you to rise as we sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty and merciful God. Invite the congregation to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of St. John, beginning at the 51st verse. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups, pots, copper vessels, and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to him, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer prohibit him to do anything for father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise we confess our Christian faith now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Under Pontius Pilate, he was taken into the city, and the people of the city sent to him, and he was crucified. He was
congregation may be seated as we continue with our sermon hymn, a reminder that we stand for the very last verse. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father in heaven and from our living Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. I want to read to you once again that second verse of the hymn we just sang. Elect from every nation, yet one or all the earth, her character of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses, with every grace endued. That is the church. You may be seated. As we gather around God's word, I had mentioned to you earlier, if you were here, um, that we are going to do a two-week sermon series. This week we're going to do what is the church, and um, for some reason it got taken out, but uh, under week two you should put the corporate nature of the church, we'll touch on that a little bit today, but look at it in more detail next week. So 
I want to ask you a question. This is a question that we had in Bible study on Tuesday. But it's also a question that I found out after I went home from Bible study that the seminary had been watching our Bible study, very quickly produced a magazine about everything we talked about in Bible study that morning and had it out by that afternoon. Isn't that amazing? But the question is simply this. What is the church? I want you to think about that. What is the church? How would you answer that question? What is the church? As you think about it, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the building? We have a building, a very nice building here. We have a, a beautiful sanctuary, nice piece of property, nice buildings on it with a school. Is it a building? Is it the people? People are gathered together. Or should we look back at the third article of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and what the church is. Well, the answer is, well, a little bit of each, maybe yes. But more specifically, as we're talking about the church today, about the Holy Christian Church, we're talking about what Christ has given to us. But we see oftentimes that the church is often misdefined. The uh, church oftentimes is cited or described as what the members are doing, and that's a misplaced idea. Now, we can take a look at the church, especially during COVID, and give endless examples of love and generosity. And those are outward acts of the church. But the question is, does that define the church? There are people who collected food for others. People who collected backpacks for kids going to school. People who helped in all different kinds of ways during COVID. All kinds of things we got to do that we never did before. Does that define the church? And I might suggest to you that those acts, although they are from the church, do not define the church. When people come here for a funeral, I don't talk about what the church has done. I don't talk about all the benevolent things that are done out there, the ways we help people. I don't talk about any of that. But what do I talk about? I talk about the church. The church in respect to its head, in respect to Jesus Christ. You see, the church is not just a gathering of common individuals. There are many who like to criticize the church and say, I do not like the organized church because they view the church in a wrong way. The church began from above. And as God's Holy Spirit comes to us, the church always also exists in relationship to one another. And that relationship to one another is really what this two-part series is all about. Christ is the one who defines the church. If you look at your sermon outline there, it, it has a Bible verse Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 16, and 18. Now, there the church is defined. There the church is defined on the confession of St. Peter. There's confusion about this in one major denomination. But what's being highlighted here by Jesus himself is the confession of Peter that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Peter, upon that rock, upon that confession that you just made, I will build my church. 
So we see there, we see that the church is first built on Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord builds his church with the public declaration of Christ, with the work of his gospel, with that gospel going out and doing things that brings God's people together. We see that there are two things we need to highlight here. A vertical understanding and a horizontal understanding. And you see what I'm doing. I'm making the sign of the cross. The vertical understanding has to do with this confession of Peter that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus becomes human to come and take care of the human problem of sin, that Jesus defines his church. It's the confession of Peter that he is the Christ, son of the living God. And then what happens next? Next, we see the second part of this. That as that word of God is preached to other people, others hear that word of God. And what does the Holy Spirit do through that word of God? The Holy Spirit through that word of God creates faith in the hearts of people who now enter in through the waters of baptism and become part of the church. God's Holy Spirit calls us. God's Holy Spirit enlightens us. God's Holy Spirit is there to make us a part of that church. So the church begins with Christ, and Christ reaches out with his word as he gives it to the apostles, and that word speaks to God's people and creates faith in the heart, and we have the church. Two very close entities, Christ and the church. Now the church, the people outnumber Christ, but that's about it. Everything that is done in the church is not from the people. Everything that is done in the church is from Christ to the people as he comes and he brings forgiveness of sins to you, as he comes and he makes you aware of that forgiveness of sins and the hope that it brings salvation for those who die in him, but they don't die eternally. This is the church. We also have there, under the understanding of the church, uh, something from our confessions. If you take a look, um, our Lutheran confessions give us the definition of the church. Look at this very carefully. And this is from Augsburg Confession 7. It's in a book called the Book of Concord as Luther's large catechism, the small catechism, small card articles, the apology. This is a part of the Augsburg Confession there. It is also taught among us that the one holy Christian church will be and will remain forever. This is the assembly of all believers, among whom the gospel is preached in its purity and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. For it is sufficient for the true unity of the Christian church that the gospel be preached with one accord in conformity with the pure understanding of it and the sacraments be administered in accordance with the divine word. Where do you see the church is the question here. And the answer here is this one holy Christian church that is eternal is found where the gospel is preached in its purity And the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper are administered rightly. Now, as we think about that, we might think about that as limiting what is going on in the church. There are some churches, even Lutheran churches, that don't preach the purity of the gospel that don't always understand the proper understanding of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, does that mean that they're going to go to hell? Not at all. They have connection with Christ. But it does mean that the gospel is not being preached in its purity and the sacraments are not being ministered uh, rightly 
or simply according to the way God has given us this stuff. If we depart from this definition, we depart from the church, and we digress just down to a group of like-minded people that like to hang around with each other. What holds us together is the pure preaching of the gospel, the right administering of the sacraments as we're shared with right here. Romans 125, though many are one body in Christ, we're brought together as one body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, we who are many are one body for we partake of one bread. And also 1 Corinthians 12, the Spirit baptizes us into one body. So the church is not organized or brought together uh, by people of like mind. Like many who use that excuse, well, I don't want to go to an organized church. Well, the church is given to us by Christ himself. And it's organized by the preaching of the word of God that touches our hearts and causes us to believe and allows us to receive baptism for the forgiveness of sins, given and shed for you communion for the forgiveness of sins. And what does that give us in the end? It gives us a true definition of the church. It reminds us that we are God's people that come together as God's people under his word. Well, look at part three of the sermon outline there. And I said, have there moving towards next week, the corporate nature of the church. And I'm really giving you one of several things I'm going to share with you next week. The first one, there is no substitute for being there. And we look at a few words, ecclesia, which is Greek, we are called out. That is the common word that was used during the time of the early church. It became a very special word to the church itself where people were called out by Christ to gather together, a community of those who believe that Christ has reconciled them with the Father. The congregation is a Latin word there. We gather together. That's the fellowship and the highest form of fellowship we have as a congregation is taking Holy Communion together. The Eucharist, we receive the gifts that God has given to us and we give thanks for those gifts, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We're going to look at some other ones in the weeks to come. Uh, Having charity towards fellow congregations during this time uh, that some separation had to take care of. Unity is more important than getting your way in matters of adi or matters that don't really matter or decisions that had to be made. Um, this one I can't read because I have horrible writing. So we'll tell you what that one is next week. Uh, do what you can connect with other Christians. Now, the bottom line of this two-part series, What is the Church? We see the church begins with Christ and the church is created by Christ through his word and that word is shown to us in the pure preaching of the gospel and the right administering of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But I had mentioned to you this magazine for the life of the world that came from the Fort Wayne Seminary and it amazed me that I picked it up the afternoon after We had Tuesday morning Bible study, and a lot of what we talked about there was right here in this magazine. So they did a good job, um, at least um, as we asked a couple questions at our Bible study. One, what is the church? I'd like to share with you uh, something the Reverend Adam Kuntz uh, wrote. He says, if one member is cut off from that vine, the branch withers. The sap of life no longer flows into him, and he shrivels up by and by. He might love the warm atmosphere of his congregation, but that doesn't come through on Facebook. He may appreciate the good people 
he grew up with, but they weren't around him when he was in lockdown. By the time the church opened up again, he had no desire to come back. The deer pants for flowing streams, but the man cut off from Christ does not thirst for the Lord. He has no desire any longer for what he has so long done without. Then he goes on to say, don't take more Sundays off. Whether for some seemingly good reasons or obviously bad reasons, we know if we, we know now, if we didn't before, that we can't afford to be off or away from Christ. We have life only in him. Without him we can do and we are truly nothing. This is a wonderful time to learn focus for all our congregations, councils, committees, and every other group in the church. If it does not promote being where and when Christ's gospel is preached and his sacraments are administered as he commanded, what's it for? This is basic, so fundamental and indispensable and essential. If what we do and what we plan as a church does not lead more branches to grow from the vine, what's it for? If it's not for building up the church, what's it for? Now what's being said there is an encouragement to get us all back into church again. Now, what are we fighting against? Well, we've been talking, that gentleman in the back there and I have been talking, about our goal of getting things as much to normal as we can by September 12th. And we're still reaching for that goal. Of course, we have to find ourselves in a place of being careful. We're going to continue to socially distance. We're going to continue to do things to help us not get one another sick and watch what's going on. But the main point is this. There's 100 to 140 people that come to church regularly. We're missing about 60 to 80. Now some can't come because they may have health reasons or health reasons in their family. And that's understandable. But I also know, as I read this article and I've also heard, Pastor, it's nice to just wear my pajamas and go over to the TV and watch. Well, what's the problem with that? The church comes together as God's people. It gathers together as Pa's people. It brings us together as God's people to share and especially to come to that highest form of fellowship where we kneel here and receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We'll talk about this more next week. In the name of Jesus, amen. As we gather around God's word and uh, we take a look at our prayers, I do have a prayer to add as we have Andrew Hayback in the hospital. If you look at the top of page six, you have a number of different prayers there. Um, peace and comfort for the family of Daryl Vallant, a very close friend of the Seth Hardesty and his family. Uh, peace and comfort for the family of my cousin Betty. Uh, who passed away this past week, and also for the family of Reverend Martin uh, Platzer of Hartwell, Georgia. And um, we have surgery for Sarah coming up this week, uh, healing for Carl, and also healing from uh, pneumonia and COVID for Jeff. And also we remember our brothers and sisters in Haiti. I've tried to get a hold of Pastor Bernard, have not heard from him Yet he is not in the center of the area. In fact, he's probably as far as you can get away from the area where things were going on. But he may be cut off from any kind of communication because of what happened there. Um, we also pray for those who are being deployed to Afghanistan for Logan Kraus uh, and also for Zach, a friend of Beth Hudges, and all of our servicemen who will be, are being deployed to Afghanistan. And also thanksgiving for the birth of a baby to my niece Erica, 
Um, we also pray for Erica. She had some difficulty this week, and um, um, we pray that uh, she continues to heal from that difficulty. And with that, I invite you to bow your heads and your hearts as we go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, give joy and hope to all your children in remembrance of their baptism, that they may rejoice in the forgiveness of sins that Christ freely pours out in his saving flood, that they also have been gathered as God's people in his church. Heavenly Father, preserve us from rejecting your commandments for the doctrines of men. By your spirit, aid, lead all Christians to keep your commandments in thought, word, and deed, honoring you in all that we do. Bless the children of all ages that they would not despise or anger their father and mother, but always honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Hear our prayers for our nation and its leaders, for all civil servants, for those who work, um, and for the, those who are there for the sake of their neighbor, and especially, Lord, we bring attention to Afghanistan and the things that are going on there. Be with those that we know who are deployed and also for those who need to be rescued from that situation that God may continue to keep them in their care and to be with our soldiers as they go ahead and continue to do those things. Lord, we also remember those who have lost loved ones for the family of Daryl Valiant, the family of Betty Zurowski, and the family of Reverend Hartwell. Lord, you remind us of that great blessing you give to your church of forgiveness, but you also remind us that that great blessing gives us eternal life found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord of life, Encourage with your word and grace all who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually. On account of illness, we include in that list Andrew Habeck, Sarah Plum, Carl, and Jeff, and Lord, Lord also Erica, and we thank you for the blessings of a new baby there. Bless all medical professionals with the skills necessary to give relief and care to their pain where possible. Strengthen the faith and sustain to everlasting life all who partake in the fellowship of this altar and receive Christ's body and blood this day in the Holy Communion. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, I invite the congregation to rise. We join together now in that prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.